me. You are worthy of it all. I yield to you. And you're just in this place where you're just pouring out your heart. And it's so real coming out of your heart. And he's meeting you there. Without those moments, you'll just have a ton of knowledge about God. I'm just telling you, without those moments, you'll just know so much about God. And it'll turn on you in time without the revelation and relationship. Because in time, all your knowledge will challenge where your life really is, and you'll get judged and condemned in your heart. I've seen it happen so many times to people that don't pursue knowing him in their personal life. Please make that your number one privilege is to know him. Like, I can hardly ever say this without crying. I always, I always hold back the tears. I don't want to play the emotional card. But man, I could cry right now. Like, nothing compares. Nothing compares to our God-given ability to be with him. Nothing. Nothing even comes close. To your God-given ability to be with him. That he would see us for what he created us to be. Pay a price to open the doorway to his presence. That we could come boldly in through Jesus Christ. And be his children. That is far from a positional stand. That is an intimate place. That is a place where I'm with him. Amen. So nothing compares with your ability. So everything I've been preaching, even yesterday, I mean, I got on the whole sexual thing and I don't even know what happened yesterday. <laughs> now I trembled for about an hour afterwards. I was like, <laughs> How's Todd do it? <laughs> yeah. Even that, you know, you, you just, all these messages, you just open your heart and you just want to make sure you're a yes before him. You might not totally understand. You might not totally be walking out the full expression, but you're in the right direction and you understand there's things possible called change. You want to be more like him and it's a yes. So when you commune with him, I'm just wide open for you. I thank you that your wisdom is in me. Your ways are in me. Lord, keep making them more revealed, more expressed, more obvious. God, thank you. Watch. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. That sure beats God. You need to do something with my life. Don't ever come to him problem shooting, troubleshooting, nitpicking with yourself. Some of the purest people I've met in my life. Have secret condemnation because in their heart they don't believe they're living up to their pure desire toward God. And they're their own worst critic and they're judging themselves and God's busy loving them. And the people around them honor their heart and see their purity and they live condemned. Yeah. Please don't do that to yourself. You, you, you got to rejoice in where you're growing. You got to rejoice that you're a different person than you were four months ago. You got to, you got to rejoice when you, even, even if you find yourself slipping into a wrong attitude and you catch it, man, you ought to rejoice that you're catching it and that you were so justified three months ago, you'd have never caught it because you were so justified and they were so, and they deserved it or they were so wrong. And, and all of a sudden that whole thing shifted. And now you're holding your own card accountable instead of justifying being less than him. And all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, I am growing. It's not, wow, I was missing it. Oh my goodness, I'm catching this thing. I'm moving forward. This is not, wow, I see God. Yay. And all of a sudden you're excited in the midst. You know, people say, well, well, well yeah, but when you slip and fall, well, when, when you slip and fall, why don't you run to him? Why, don't, why, why do we run from him and hide and put on fig leaves? We already found that's not where God wants you. He took the leaves off. He, he clothed them himself. That's your righteousness. So you don't run from God ever. You run right to him. You say, yeah, but I was so ashamed. No, that's Adam. That's not covenant. No, you ought to rejoice that truth's working in your heart, that you see things for what they are, and you run straight to him and let him hold you in that place of prayer. And you say, Father, I thank you. You're growing me. Oh, my goodness. This thing is dying in my life. It is being removed. This is so not who you are in me. It is so not the desire of my heart. And all of a sudden, freedom's come into your life. And after you're praying in communion, all of a sudden, you're closer to God. When you, when you enter into this place, then than you were before you started slipping into the thing. 
See, when you have a God whose love never fails, it doesn't empower you to stay the same. It's an invite to be absolutely wrecked and transformed in a beautiful and powerful way. So you run to him and, and you receive from him his love, his mercy and his grace. He, I, re, I remember one time in my life, I, 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 I did something, uh, I said something to a guy and, and we were talking and I didn't realize that I let what he said bother me. Like I couldn't believe he said it. And it was a good, pretty good while ago. And, and uh, I got in my car and I started to drive. And I responded to him and stuff. And who knows, you can still say the right thing, but you can be saying it from the wrong place. But he didn't know it. He didn't perceive it. God is such a father, guys. But I'm always asking him to father me. Thank you for fathering me. I say stuff like this. Holy Spirit, I so love you in my life. I have more of a confidence in your ability to keep me than me to miss it. So I'm just going to keep running. And if I get anywhere off track, you will keep me aligned because you love me and you love others. That's pretty freeing. So I'm never on eggshells. I always have a liberty in him. You see what I'm saying? But I got in my car and he said, uh, the Lord said, boy, you left that bother you. You didn't talk from a good place and you were offended. And I was like, oh, when the Lord says that, you're not like, oh, Lord, I wasn't offended. No, <laughs> when he says that, you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> and uh, I just was like, man. Things snuck up on me. Isn't that crazy? So the Holy Spirit inspired me. I'm in the car and I'm like, Father, I just thank you. Watch what I reaffirmed. I just thank you that no, nobody owes me anything. I just remove the expectations on people that, that set them up to fail in my eyes. God, you don't live that way or I've failed you a hundred times over. You have looked at me for destiny, purpose, value, potential, and you have done nothing but love me. And God, I thank you that that's the way that I view every individual. And I just thank you, God, for loving me and empowering me and fathering me through this little motive and just purifying and cleansing my heart. And then, so I wasn't like, oh man, I sinned. Hello? I wasn't like, Todd, man, can you just pray with me, dude? I just messed up. No, I got a father. I'm right. I'm like, oh, Lord. Yeah, thank you. Ah, I'm just dealing with this, working this out. Whew. But the yes in my heart rises up above the thing that I did. So that the yes in my heart begins to bring uh, 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 action to my life where all of a sudden this thing that I did is no more. And watch, I didn't bite my lip to try to stop judging or being offended or I didn't. How do you try to not be offended? If you're trying to not be offended, you're offended. <laughs> it just fascinates me. People say, well, I, I'm trying to forgive. No, that's called unforgiveness. And somehow we take this long road where we think we have to go through the unforgiveness, feel it, live it, experience it, and then apply scripture to it till the feeling of unforgiveness somehow goes away. What about not even having a grid for unforgiveness? What about being alone with God and saying, thank you, your heart is my heart. Nobody owes me a thing. Make that real to me, God. I'm done living through this gauntlet of up and down and auto, not okay and doing better, brother. Man, I just don't want to be moved. Jesus, I don't see you moved. You asked me to follow you. Oh my goodness, what an invite. If you said follow me, it must be possible through the person of Holy Spirit. Man, mold me and shape me in your love and make me look like you. That's prayer. <laughs> yeah? So you know what I did when I got home? I called the person. Because that's true repentance. That's really holding yourself in a good, healthy place. That's when you know you're serious. When you call the person and say, hey, listen, man. When you said that and we were talking, man, I interpreted your heart a certain way. And I, I, it hit me. I let that offend me. And when I talked back to you I, and it gave you an answer. And he said, no, you gave me wisdom, man. That was an amazing answer. And your response, I took it to heart. And I said, well, I appreciate that. Who knows God can still speak. But he didn't want me to get familiar with living from that place where I was saying something from the wrong. You can be right and be wrong. And he didn't want me living that way. He, he loves us. He loves us. 
he brought that out of me. So I called this person. And I told him, and then I said, well, actually, and then I said, I told him what the Lord, he said, man, I'll just assure you, I had no idea. And when I hung up the phone, it fascinated me. The love of God. How that mattered to him to expose that to me. So I thought this purity thing, man, it's really what it is. It's purity. Like, like he's addressing my inner motive. That's why I talk about motives all the time when you hear me preach. I just talk about the reason why in your perspective and where you're living from. The why behind your life. He's into that because that's the real you. That's what decides how high you fly. The why behind your life. That's what decides the end result of a thing. Are you with me? And that's why he said the pure in heart shall see God. Ain't that awesome? So maybe the not so pure in heart can still talk about him. <laughs> but the pure in heart will see him. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Let's do this. I was sitting over there and I said, Lord, really? Are we like, am I supposed to really track through this? And he said, yep, I want you to finish this. I asked him. I just asked him. I was on my knees. Go to, go to Ephesians. We're going to start in... Uh, of four, chapter four, I want to finish something up. I really do. I, I feel like I'm supposed to do this. This scripture is in the Bible. This stuff is in the Bible and it all has to do with your conduct and living. So there has to be a way to read it and talk about it and teach it without getting caught up in works and legalism. And we sure just don't want to be, be some carefree, you know, just, I'm not in against flagging. Don't hear what I'm not saying into some just flag waving, woo, whatever, brother. Right? There is an accountability. There is a responsibility. I mean, LCU has 13 laws I heard yesterday. 13 laws. <laughs> Don't break any. You break one. You No. <laughs> no. But, but they're, 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 they're things that we should all embrace that, that, that are designed to shape character, to leave right expression and, 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 and impact. People interpret, they see things in your life. Listen, when you're working on a job and you have exemplary integrity in the Lord because you're in fellowship with God and your attitudes are clean and your motives are pure, who knows, people will still feel like they need to label that, figure that out, and define it. Who knows that people will get threatened by it and still say, oh, you're too goody-goody. You're more holier than thou. Oh, wow, you, don't, you can't associate with us. And it's nothing, it has nothing to do with none of that. That's just their flesh reaction. You can't be moved by none of that. You know you're not living segregated. You're right in the midst of them. You're in the world. You're just not of the world. So it looks weird to people. You're saved from a perverse generation that was living for their own thing. And you've been a partaker, Second Peter 1, of his divine nature. You've escaped the corruption that's in the world through self-centered seeking. So you live different. You just live different. Who knows that people will still take the initiative to have to comment on that. And it might look negative. Don't let that bother you at all. That's just an expression of where they're living, where they're coming from. Sometimes they even find strength in numbers. Because you're the oddball. It says men will mock and scoff at the things they don't understand. You can't let that change conduct, and character, and consistency because this is what I've learned. I promise you I've learned this in my life. I've been on several secular jobs since I've been saved. And man, they're my funnest place. I love this. I love your hearts. I love this hunger. But you put me on a, you put me on a, a 40 hour job where 90% of the people around me don't know the Lord. I love that because of the everyday consistency, just watching their minds wig out, just watching how you get to walk out Christ in every situation where it's not just walking in, thus says the Lord, ah! and then you got the, all the people say, no, just them seeing your consistent, solid, set in stone life because you have relationship. It's what's been missing in the body of Christ. Consistent expression of spirit-filled living. Not spooky living, not just miracles and signs. I'm talking about attitude. I'm talking about integrity. 
I'm talking about purity. I'm talking about lives that are sanctified and set apart. I'm telling you, the world is more thirsty to view that than they even realize. Yeah. I've had so much fun in my life. <laughs> I don't even share a lot of testimonies anymore because this thing's on YouTube. Todd's messed my whole life up. <laughs> he has. <laughs> Because then everybody wants you to pray for them and wants a word from you and stuff. But I have fun in my life. I just don't talk about the details too much. I loved, I stopped pastoring for a season. I was pastoring for several years and I just, I was struggling with ministry a little, the idea of it. I was, I felt, I was a pastor, I was a board member. I felt like church was a business on some ends. Some things just bothered me. It wasn't that it was wrong. It was just me trying to get a good view. I was struggling with ministry and I was, I was, I was struggling. And I said, Lord, I'm just going back to work for a little. I need to air out and get some wisdom. I would really have fun just going work a job. I had friends say, what are you doing going back to work? Dude, you got it made. Come on. You're doing full-time ministry for heaven's sakes. You're getting paid for doing Jesus. I can't tell you how many people said that to me. I'm like, I am not in this thing to get paid. I am in this thing because I'm in this thing. <laughs> I'm in this thing. <laughs> Yay. Sorry if I look flaky right now because I feel a little flaky. I'm in this thing. <laughs> So, so it was fun to go to that job. I, I left pastoring the board, the pastors. I said, look, I'm going to give back my finances, cut, just cut off the finances. I'll still function pastorally. I don't want to leave you totally high and dry. I'll still do the Sunday night thing and I'll oversee and, and, and some of the people as best I can within the work schedule. But I just need some time. They said, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. I just, I just need just to break away a little and just, yeah. And some of it is just, I, I have fun in that setting. I, in, in my Christian position I was in, everything was Christian. The people backslid and said, amen, brother. It was just everything. And I can deal with that because I get, you know, I just, I'm a pastor. I, I, I'm not condemning nobody. I'm not saying my heart's hurt by that. What I'm saying is it was just everything was Christian. When you go to work, it's hardly anything's Christian. And, and there's no smoke screens. And I mean, you don't understand maybe in leadership like manifestations, who knows they're real? Who knows God will touch people and whack people and mess people up? But who knows that they become a thing in the church? All of a sudden manifestations are acted out. Some people are manifesting to fit in. Some of them will go to school like this and they feel like they got to follow to reveal spirituality. So when you're in leadership, you have all those paradoxes in front of you. And sometimes you don't even want to address them because you don't want to touch things wrong. And you really need wisdom in the workplace. You don't have any of those issues. <laughs> you just got people dropping F bombs and talking about whatever. And you're not even trying to discern who's faking a manifestation to fit in. <laughs> it's just full blown manifestation. <laughs> I'm just telling you, there's a side to pastoring you need to understand. And pastors, pastors, have, who knows that some pastors have gotten caught being controlling and et cetera. But then what happens is every time a person tries to pastor, he runs the risk of being called a controller because he's trying to steward and watch over men's souls. And there's a lot of things to consider. It's a little more sticky than you realize, maybe when you really care. If you don't care, well, then you don't care. So whatever. But when you really care, you have to address this stuff. But at work, you just go to work <laughs> in Jesus. You know what was amazing? I never even thought about finances. I just left. I just went to work. And my church treated me really well. I worked a job for 15 years in a warehouse that was Teamsters Union. I had the best health benefits on the planet. I had a paid pension that I wasn't putting the penny into. 
It wasn't a 401k. It was a Teamsters union pension that my company was contributing to through Teamsters. So it wasn't even coming out of my pocket. It was an amazing job. And it was just blue collar, hard work, lift a lot of weight. But man, they took care of me financially for not having a college degree, right? My church asked me to pastor. This was healthy. I said no three times to pastoring. Some people can't wait for the day they're asked that. That's probably why they're not getting asked. <laughs> I had friends saying, what are you doing saying no? Are you crazy? I wish they'd asked me. I'd jump on it. I said, that's why they ain't asking you. <laughs> I would tell them, I'm not a pastor. They say, oh, you're a pastor. You don't understand. I said, no, I'm not. I'm a warehouse worker in love with Jesus. Yeah, but look what God's doing through your life. I said, he doesn't do those things through pastors. He does those things through believers. So I would just share and I was like, just because you see God moving in my life, you want to put me in leadership. I'm, I'm always in leadership because there's light in me and light's greater than darkness. So I always carry influence. It's so simple. I'm looking at a whole room of leaders. As soon as you get born again, you're in leadership, even though you're learning, mentoring and following all through your life in an area of your life. You're a leader because there's light in you and it's greater than darkness. So you always carry influence as a Christian, whether you're discipling, whether you're coming to LCU, there's a component of your life that carries influence that actually causes you to be a leader in certain faucets of your day. You get it? So my church said, we're not asking you to sacrifice. We will match what you're making. We'll, we'll match your compensation. And I said, honestly, this isn't even about money, guys, but that's a beautiful offer. Thank you. I just don't believe I'm a pastor. I just love being at my job and shining because I had worked there 13 years with the guys. I was just one of the guys. Now I'm born again. Now I'm there two and a half years, two years, and I'm totally transformed. So for two years, two and a half years total, I got to go to work every day, born again. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I got persecuted to no end. People mad at me, people saying I'm brainwashed, I'm in a cult, I got around the wrong people, they deceived me. And I would just smile gently and say, if you guys could help me, like, what's negative about my life? The only thing the one guy could come up with is you're so polite, it makes me sick. <laughs> it's the only thing they could say. The bosses saw me as a yes man, I'm a pushover. So they gave me jobs that everybody else would fight over and push down and bump down to lower senior men. And then I'd just say, sure, yeah, I'll do it. No problem. Because I was there to do my work unto the Lord. Why does the bad job have to always fall on the low man? Why does the low man always have to carry the weight? I'll do it. It's no big deal. I'm here to work. I'll do it. And then my coworkers were on me because you're making it bad for all of us. And they're going to expect us to do these jobs. So I had it from every angle. But I'm just having the time of my life. Supervisor calls me on my day off. This is my first job when I got saved. He calls me on my day off. He says, uh, hey, Dan, I says, he says, this is so and so. I said, hey, what's going on? I'm like, why is he calling my house? He's like, I'm sorry, I know it's your day off. I said, no, are you kidding? Why'd you call? What's up? Well, I just don't know how you live the way you do. And I said, well, what do you mean? Oh, come on, man. If I was in your shoes, I would be so angry. I'd be a mess. I see what the bosses, he's a boss. I see what the bosses are doing to you. And then I see the heat you're taking from the coworkers. And somehow you walk in this joy, this peace, you, you never change. And he said, I know you're going to tell me it's Jesus, but I don't understand what that means. I said, why don't you come over to my house? We sat on the porch, talked, he cried and we prayed. And he said, Jesus, I want you this way. I want you. Now. I didn't have a bullhorn. Consistency. An attitude that was undeniable. After I left that workplace, a guy that was really mad because his mama died of cancer and he had issues with God and he had a lot of issues with Christians because they said one thing and did another. And then Christians wear their little bumper stickers on their car, not perfect, just forgiven, so that we can validate our lifestyles. Come on, Dan. <laughs> 
Oh, God. <laughs> I felt a strange vibration in the room on that. I'm not suggesting we're perfect, but when we need to, the world is not impressed by that bumper sticker. They see it as a permission slip to embrace a belief and stay the same. So they are not impressed with your Jesus. Because all you have different than them is the same belief system. But you get thrown in crisis, you'll cry just like they cry. You get thrown in crisis, you'll fret like they fret. You get done wrong, you'll be angry like they're angry. They do not need to go to your church service because you're the same as them in their eyes. Or what happens on the job when you live consistent, people start bumping into him in your life over and over. And then they start asking you questions. You're not initiating anything. And that's so scriptural. We don't talk about it much because we go evangelize so much. But in the Bible, they saw their lives and said, what must we do to be saved? What shall we do, men and brethren? They came to the Christians and said, how can I have the life I see in you? Isn't that what's in your Bible? I'm not saying evangelizing is wrong. It's a strange quiet in here right now. I'm not saying evangelizing is wrong. What I'm saying is what happened to men and sirs? What must we do to be saved? That's really good, Dan. I have had that in my life so much that I'm convinced it's the Lord's way. That's really amazing <laughs> because they're coming to you from their heart because they're convinced, which means convicted by your life. They're seeing him before their eyes and it makes their heart hungry. People I've never even preached to. People I've never even spoken and explained the gospel that I worked with that never gave me the opportunity would come up to me weeping and say, I don't understand your life. How can I have what I see in your life? I say, it's really simple, man. Here's what I have in my life. And I tell him about how selfish I was, how I was living for me. And friend, what you're, what you're viewing is it's a man that incorporated Jesus into his life. Jesus's life came into me and now he is my life. And, and I've prayed to him so I could think like him and look like him and love like him and perceive like him. And the person of Holy Spirit makes it possible. So if you really want what you see in my life, then you have to die to everything you call you. So everything he is can come alive in you. And then we're going to pray and he's going to come into you. And then we're going to find water and get you baptized. I'll hold you under till every bubble stops. I have faith for it. When I pull you up, <gasps> new life, it'll be good. And then, no, I don't tell them that. <laughs> and then, and then we're going to lay hands on you and the power and person of the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and baptize you. That's, that's what you do. And you take them to water. I, I've baptized so many people in water like that, that just take them down my home. I'm at my fine water. I've been in people's houses. I said, just go fill up your tub right now. Coworkers, fill up your tub. Really? Yeah, fill it up. It's going to be amazing. Come on, open your heart. And we go back into their bathroom and baptize them in their bathtub. I give them a Bible because I took one with me because I knew what was coming. Come on. I'm just telling you. Co-workers in their bathtubs. Why was I in their homes? They asked me to come because they didn't understand my life and they wanted to understand. Because in time, through all the persecution, their hearts couldn't escape them. And they said, their convictions, and they said, there's something real here. There's something I don't understand. And there was nothing negative about it. Everyday consistency is a big deal. Unbelievers see inconsistency and then they write it off. You say, brother, I feel so pressured. It sounds like you're talking about perfection. I'm talking about total purity that's empowered by grace. You'd be amazed how perfect that can look. We're almost afraid to talk about it. We're so used to us that we've lorded our experience over following him. And we're actually following ourselves, not realizing it. Well, we think this is how we are and this is how he is. And we're trying to find a happy medium. 
Nope, Christ in me is the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. The reason I'm reading these scriptures is because they're in our Bible in a lot of places, and it has to do with conduct. The answer to walking in these things is your yes before God. I promise you it's this simple. You have to sincerely be willing to walk this way. You say, well, that's, that's everybody's willing. No, not everybody's willing to become love. We prove it along the way of our life. We sit in services, we have encounters, we get prophecy, but we stay offended. We find a right to be hurt. And we call it normal and we justify it. And all of a sudden you have three reasons for not looking like him. Because of this, that and the other. Not everybody's willing to become love. You have to be willing to become love. You have to die to everything you've ever been. So who he is can be alive in you. That's a place of prayer, people. That is not an altar call. That is a place of prayer. That is you getting alone with him and yielding and surrendering and letting the great potter come upon you and shape you into the masterpiece he created you to be. You're the clay. All the clay does is yield. All the clay does is yield. Clay just yields to the hand, the pressure, the wisdom, the craftsmanship, and the master creativity of the potter. And he'll spin you on that wheel, and he'll push a little here. He'll just do a little extra work, and oh, that's perfect. And, and then, ta-da! All you do is stay in that place where you're a yes, sincere yes, and you're willing, and you take accountability for your own heart. You're your best accountability partner. And when you go to sleep at night, your conscience is clear because you're going after him. Come on, why do yourself injustice and live anything else? Why not value yourself enough through the blood to position yourself right there? That's true faith. That's true humility to receive what he says about you and not fight it. <laughs> so if he says, I love you, yay, be loved. If he says, I forgive you, forgive him, Father, be forgiven and never look back. If he says you're righteous, then stand before him as if you've never sinned. <laughs> yeah? It's the only way you'll stop fighting with sin. Just stand before him as if you've never sinned. And watch how the power, temptation, drive, and drawl of sin begins to dissipate in your life. And you're not under the control of it as much as you think. And it's sad you can hardly preach it in America without being called a heretic. But I got so many scriptures to back it up. It just means we don't read our Bible. We lord our own human experience even over his word. And that's a shame because he's magnified his word above his own name. You with me? I hope you're getting something out of this. I worked two and a half years in this job. And I never confronted those people. I never did anything like that. I just lived the life of Jesus. If they asked me questions, believe me, I took the liberty to answer. So there were certain lunches where I was in the lunchroom and somebody asked a question. So the whole lunchroom got preached to. It was phenomenal. I remember being in a situation where one of the forklift drivers was sitting upside down on a case, taking his break like he was reading a paper, and they hit me in the cross aisle with a question, and six or seven men stood there, and with passion I poured out my heart and explained Christ. He was sitting 25 feet away. He was not reading his paper. After I, That was right towards when I was ready to leave to go pastor. I finally did leave to go pastor. The Lord showed me I was supposed to after they asked me three times in a six-month period. And uh, it was uh, two weeks after I left there, he was afraid to ask his wife if she would go to church with him because he thought she'd laugh at him. But he was so convicted by everything that he went to his wife. Watch how cool God is. He, he, he told me this story because I bumped into him like a couple months later at a countywide prayer meeting. And he's coming up the steps and he's supposed to be at work and he took a personal day to be there. And he was hoping he'd run into me. It's such a joy, such a crown. Then you lay it all at his feet. And just 
<laughs> yeah. He, he's coming up the steps. See, you don't understand. When you're in faith, when you really believe the gospel, his life is worth that much. Or you can cop a little attitude and send him some different message. Or you can have him in your life and have a season of influence in his life and just be another person that goes to church. No, no, no. You walk in him. You live in him. Every life matters. You see what I'm saying? It's intense and it's powerful, right? But it's all a privilege and a joy. None of this is a strain. People say, thank you for coming and thank you. And I travel to churches every weekend I'm somewhere. Thank you so much that you would come. I said, do I look like I'm sacrificing? You don't have to thank me for a thing. I understand why you say that. I get it. But the truth is I'm having the time of my life. The spirit of God is inside of me. You understand what I'm saying? He come up the steps. He said, I said, what are you doing here? He said, hey, Danny. He hugged me. He said, he's a big boy. I mean, a big boy. He hugged me. He said, I was hoping I'd see you here. Stop. Wait, what are you doing here? He said, well, Danny, my heart was so convicted by your life and your words. And there was a point where I just knew I needed to make a change. And I said, I know one of the most Impacting nights of your life was in this man was when I was in the cross. And you see, he said that was the turning point. See, I knew because you get perceptions. I'm talking to these six men, but I was more aware of him than them. I just knew because some of them were just maybe even testing me. Who knows? It's still good. I'm just Danny gospel seed. You, I'm just. <laughs> right. So just throw as much seed as you can. But I just felt like something good was going on here. He, he told me he went home to his wife. Two weeks after that, I left and went to go be a pastor. Left my job. And that spoke to the men that I gave up my seniority, my years, my... You know, I didn't give up my pension, but I cut off my pension and my benefits because I transitioned. He said, I said to my wife, Honey, I need to ask you something. Don't laugh. I was wondering how you'd feel about us going to church down the street here. And they, it was actually a, a, a very good church. I was aware of the pastor. I knew the pastor personally. And uh, he said, and when I say a very good church, just, just, I just know what they're preaching is the gospel. And uh, he said, she looked at me and tears filled her eyes. And she said, I've been wanting to ask you that for weeks. And I thought you'd laugh at me. He said, we went to church and the pastor had an altar call and we held hands and walked the altar, knelt and cried and both got born again. Like, ah! I was at another Christian event just several months after and I seen a guy there who was not a Christian when I knew him last. And I ran over and I said, hey, Al, what are you doing? He said, Dan, he hugged me. I was like, what is going on, man? Are you saved? He said, the whole time you were at work, the whole two years, my heart was ripped, man. He said, I tormented myself with convictions for two years, but I didn't want to face the persecution. I saw them. He said, when you weren't around, they just degraded you. They laughed at you. They mocked. And, and when you weren't around, they talked about you. Like, and, and, and he said, but I knew you were free. And I could see you were changed. And he said, they could all see it too. And he said, but I didn't want them doing that about me. And he said, all of a sudden I realized, what am I doing? Like, why am I letting them keep me from truth? He said, so I just got saved. And he said, now I attend this church. And I'm like, ah. there was so many guy comes up to me. I haven't seen him for, I was a coworker. I hadn't seen him forever. He says, Hey brother. I said, Hey brother, I'm thinking he's being facetious. Cause that's the way they used to, they'd be at the time clock. Hallelujah, brother. See you tomorrow. The unbelievers would do that to me just in a mocking sense. And I'm thinking, what are they mocking? I got more peace in my life than I can explain. I'm going to go in and get in my car and God's going to speak to me. I'll be pumping gas and somebody's going to get touched. What are you mocking? Like, what are you making fun of? I'm going to wake up and Christ is going to be inside of me. And the day in front of me is going to be a gift. How do you persecute that? Ah! See, I'm a mess. I've been a mess for a while. He 
He said, hey, brother. And I said, brother, I said, please tell me you're not joking and tell me you got saved. He said, it's the most amazing thing. And all of a sudden, I, I was like, I saw Jesus in his eyes. I was like, just brought me to tears. I said, you did, you weren't being sarcastic. He said, no, he was driving from a bar down the road. So much conviction in him, he's driving. And the Lord said, isn't it enough? How about meeting me now? Came in his car, the Lord. Pretty confident fella, the Lord. Just came in his car. He said, I swerved off the road. I was on a back country road. He said, I opened up the door. I could barely walk. He said, I was overwhelmed. He said, I knelt on the asphalt. And I said, I give you my life. I had two co-workers leave work, stop on the way home along the road, overwhelmed by the spirit, praying in tongues, couldn't even drive and got right with God, praying in tongues in their car, trying to get home. I can tell you stories like this for a while. You know why? Power of the spirit. I get it. Consistency. The Lord said, Dan, your life lived in front of them for these two and a half consistent years has unplugged ears that were otherwise stopped because they were holding on to the hypocrisy experience. They were holding on to whoever that, like a guy that we worked with years back before I got saved, he came, he came and, oh, this is amazing. The supervisor I told you about that called me, this was him five, six years before. His marriage fell apart, so he went to a church and said to a pastor, can you pray for my marriage? And he said, well, you got to do things for God if he's going to do something for you. He said, make sure you hand some tracks out and, and this and that, and he'll restore your marriage. So he's in at work handing out tracks. And then his wife came back to him. He never, ever went back to church. He just went back to the same old lifestyle. So he was like, he made a little plea bargain with God. Hey, I'll do a couple things for you. How about you doing me a favor? And then five, six years later, he runs into my changed life. And then he's convicted because, yeah. Wow. Consistency, guys. It's why, it's why all these scriptures are here. Peter talks about perilous times. And in the last days, there's going to be men that really have the appearance of God. But all these things are in their heart. And the list is amazing. I read that stuff from time to time. Like I, I go to all of them in a row. You say, what? Yeah, I go all of them in a row. And just then I go into worship and rejoice that I can't find them in my heart. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of people think we have to have those things in our heart. See, I'm either a real deceived and twisted man and I'm living off the temporal looks you're giving me right now. Or I'm speaking the conviction of my life and what I believe is true and what I've lived for 23 years. And I'll stand before him someday. And we'll find out. Are you with me? So it's one or the other. I'm either the most deceived man you've ever met. Or I bumped into something. Called Jesus. <laughs> someday we'll find out. But for now, I told you, I told you, power love, I got all my chips on free, on the free space. What are you free from, Dan? I'm free from myself. That makes me free from you, circumstances, the devil. He only works with what you give him. Jesus said, the rule of this world cometh has nothing in me. I'm following Jesus. I'm going to stick with Jesus on that one. He cometh and has nothing in me. He who keeps himself, the evil one touches him not. That doesn't mean circumstances. He touches him not. Come on. He touches him not. We think circumstances. 
When I was going through witchcraft, leaders in my life, the only people I had to talk to that were leaders in my life, not one of them was able to help me in that situation. In fact, if I'd have listened to them, it would have been a great detriment. They were telling me I was in spiritual pride and you need to go to the hospital. And I said, it's witchcraft. The Lord's showing me it's witchcraft. I don't need a prescription or a name. I've got the finished work. I'm not against doctors. Make it known, tape running. I'm not against doctors. There was a time I took my wife to the emergency room. The Lord said it's witchcraft. Why? So I knew how to stand and fight, period. There was no other option. Jesus is going to deliver me or I'm not getting delivered, but I'm not budging from this place. I just took that stand. You can hardly preach that. You get criticized for it, but I think I'm doing okay all these years later. It put a passion in me that was amazing. Like, really amazing. But this one pastor said, Dan, you need to get real and use wisdom, brother. You need to look at your leg. And I said, brother, when would you ever preach that from the pulpit on a Sunday? You'll preach the total opposite. The drums will roll. Everybody will say hallelujah and you'll feel like a preacher. And now behind the scenes, because you're scared and you care about me, you're telling me to do what you would never preach to the people. And the other brother said, well, yeah, but Dan, here's what I think he's trying to say. He's like, I mean, if you look at your leg, you have to see like this is happening. It's real, Dan, because my leg was twice the size of the other one and I couldn't even use it. It was completely immobile. It was like completely dead. I literally had to drag it along. And he said, and, and I think what's puzzling me so much, and he complimented my heart. He said, I don't know anybody in my life that understands righteousness like you. And I'm envious of your relationship with Holy Spirit. He said, and I'm just troubled. Like, I don't even know how the devil's allowed to touch you like this. And I said, touch me. Do you think he's touching me? I said, you're looking at my leg. How about looking right here and tell me if he's touching me? See, that's the difference. We go surface, circumstances, blessing, favor, protection, cover me. He's talking about right here where this isn't for sale, come hell or high water, and everything looks like it's falling apart, but your mind's already settled and you don't know how to change your mind. And you're not going to look at outward appearance because you've been settled in your heart. You with me? Come on. It was so convicting to those pastors. I said, maybe you guys need to get your eyes off my leg for a second and look right here. And man, when I said that, I could feel my friend. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, Jesus thumped that witchcraft. It was so dramatic. It was so crazy. It would have made a wild, crazy video. And, and after it was all over, I laid on my bed, not joking, not in self-righteousness, in true compassion. I cried for an hour on my bed and said, God, are we ready for what we say is warfare? Are we even ready to step out, run hard, and weather these things and keep our eyes on you? Or would we turn inward, get confused, and take the adversity personal? And I cried for one hour and interceded and asked God for grace on us as a church. Because sometimes the highest faith we release is for good circumstances. And when the circumstances aren't working, we wonder where our faith is failing. And we let how it's going determine how we're doing. Instead of who he is inside of us. Come on. That's just good solid preaching right there. That'll take you right straight through the witchcraft. And you know what happened? You know what happened? I got so passionate and so evident of his lordship. You believe you believe it. But until you go through Nebuchadnezzar's fire. You probably don't have the revelation that Shadrach had after he came out. Are you with me? A lot of times people see passion and they think it's because you're riding above the clouds. No, you see passion because you've been through a lot of fire. But you don't see one smell of smoke. But you do see passion. Why? Because he's Lord. Are you following me? Come on. Oh, yeah.
I, I feel like shouting loud. I'm going to behave, but man, you know, if I, if I was alone and not mic'd up right now, it would be, it would be not pretty. My mother-in-law came to my house when nobody was home but me. And she didn't realize my wife's car wasn't there. She just pulled in and walked to the back door to drop something off. And she heard me in the house screaming at the top of my lungs. And I was upstairs. She was at the back garage door. She could hear me screaming inside the house. The house was echoing, she said. And she thought I was yelling at somebody in the family. Scream, because that would have been me before Jesus. And she just said she cowered back to her car and thought, I don't want to get in the middle of this. Oh, my goodness. Dan fell off the wagon. She got to her car. She told my wife the story and said, you don't know how greatly that affected me, this experience. She said it affected her. I have such a voice in my mother-in-law's life. She comes back to the house because she gets out there and realizes Kim's car's not there. And it's only my truck. And she's like, who's he yelling at? <laughs> I worship you, God. I thank you. You've saved me, changed me. I'll never be the same. God, I thank you. Live. I honor you, King Jesus. You alone are God. <sighs> Madman for hours. I've been a madman for hours for years now. And she goes. Oh. <gasps> Back to her car. And you know what happened inside her? She went, wow, he ain't doing that for nobody. He ain't on a platform. He ain't leading no prayer meeting. He's the only one home. He's got doors closed. He's in a room and he's screaming like a madman. <laughs> People always they say that. Well, you're out of your mind. No, I'm out of yours. <laughs> mm. She called my wife. She said, I came over to the house to drop it off. Dan's upstairs screaming. Well, she said, oh, yeah, he's. He's. <laughs> He screamed before up there. She said, well, I thought he was yelling at you or the kid. She said, oh, my goodness, no. He doesn't raise his voice at me and the kids. <laughs> but, man, he yells at God. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Kim, you don't know how much that affected me. To come over and know he was in the room at that intensity with all his heart. It shows me how much he believed. And how real God is to him. She said, that has affected me. Since then, I have such a voice in her life. I've prayed with her. I've watched God just take her out. My own mother-in-law. And it wasn't, take her out, God. <laughs> Fire! Oh! Oh! I said, yes, Lord, finally! <laughs> It wasn't like that ever. Because <laughs> you love people. Will you, will, you, will you do my heart, God's heart, and your own heart a big favor just for a second and have fun with me? And just dare believe it's possible. You personally, just, just dare believe and just in your heart say yes. and Just believe that it's possible to not be offended. To not be hurt, to not be judgmental, to not be critical, to not hate people, despise people, to be rubbed wrong. Believe right now that it's possible. And just tell Holy Spirit, you're going to step out and believe it's possible to not be rubbed wrong. To where you're pushed into an attitude that's never found in God. That you actually believe he can sanctify your emotions, your conduct, your vision, your perspectives in such a way that you can experience the salvation of the soul. And you can actually get a redeemed mind, will, and emotions that looks like Adam before sin. Just believe that right now for a second. And just believe it's possible to live and not have negative attitude. 
to not have darkness intermingled, to not be reactionary, mopey, pouty, self-centered, feeling sorry for yourself. Oh, would you just believe right now that you could live and never again feel sorry for yourself? Yes. Father, I ask you to bless that and grace that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Yay. Okay. Look, you don't have to believe me. I, you, you know, you won't criticize me. Somebody catches this mic, but it doesn't matter. I'll stand before the Lord. Right. To my knowledge, I'm not boasting in me right now. Don't hear it for that. Don't make me a hero because of this. Just believe it's possible. Yes. To my knowledge, I, if, if, unless I'm mistaken, but to my conviction and my knowledge, in the 24 in June, it'll be 24 years I've been saved, I've felt sorry for myself. And got caught in it one time. And it lasted. It was probably under five minutes. And Holy Spirit said. What are you doing laying on your face crying for mercy? Stand to your feet. You're a man of faith. And I, 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 I look like one of them people that does acrobat stuff. I was laying prostrate. And I, I was on my feet. I don't even know how I got there. I just, <laughs> sure. I was ready, man. I was like, <laughs> my family went through a hard time. My, 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 my family made bad choices all at the same time, and they kind of weakness sprung off of weakness. And thoughts come to your mind and say, hmm, when you weren't saved, they all walked away from you and didn't want to be in the room with you. Now you are saved, and they do the same. What have you gained? Well, that's the devil. I didn't get saved for my family to gather around me. I got saved to become the man he paid for. My family gathering around me is certainly my desire, and it's certainly a perk and benefit. But even if your whole loved ones and decide to run off and go another way, you still got to answer what you're doing with Jesus. You can't let that matter more. You can't get saved so your spouse gets saved. You get saved to become the person that God created you to be, irregardless of your spouse's choices and decisions. That's the way grace will come on your spouse. Because my family's doing amazing. Don't get me wrong. My wife is amazing. She's got a tender heart. She's a woman of prayer. She, she's doing as good today as probably any time I've seen her spiritually today. Both my children are doing very, 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 very well. In the Lord. So everybody's doing great. But there was a season of eight years where it looked like a bomb was blown up into my home. That's why I'm so passionate about these topics because I had the privilege of walking it all out. It's not my doctrine. It's my life. It's, it's, and it wasn't a struggle. I wasn't calling people asking for prayer and encouragement. Never even thought of that. It never even dawned on me. Because I never felt run down by it. There was one time in the living room where something manifested and happened. And he comes at opportune times. And I was, I was already challenged by such a circumstance. And then there was a little more fuel thrown on this fire. And in my heart, I was like, no. And I just ran to my bedroom and I was laying on my face crying. Saying, have mercy, God. And all I was doing was saying, I feel so sorry for myself. How can they all do this to me? Holy Spirit didn't even let me stay there. He was like, duh. Because I asked him to keep me on track. I asked him to father me. It was probably the second most militant I've ever heard the Lord speak to me. He said, what are you doing? And he wasn't disgusted with me. I didn't receive that, you know, he's repulsed by me. He was just intense. And my children to this day know if daddy gets a stern face and talks to them stern, it's really important. And they probably should stop thinking and listen. They don't think, wow, dad's mad. It's because we're talking about life and death. And I get intense sometimes. It's not because I'm mad. My family has learned that when I come across that way, Probably ought to listen. This is spiritual and important. They don't think, boy, dad's, dad's mad. Let's grow a little deeper than that. Yes. Yes. Holy Spirit said, 
what are you doing? Laying on your face crying for mercy. Stand to your feet. You should have heard it. It shook me. Stand to your feet. What's he telling me? You're not seeing what I'm seeing, boy. This is all working. You've lost nothing no matter where they're at. You're in me and I'm in you. Stop getting misguided with wrong thinking. Get up, boy, and be who you are. It was amazing. I won't go into detail because it's too personal what happened in the next 10 minutes, but it was absolutely incredible. God, you're good. I hope some of this stuff's helping. It's, it's, it's everyday conduct. It's mind perceptive perspectives. There's two places in the New Testament where it talks about the salvation of your soul. It's 1 Peter 1 and it's Hebrews 10, the end of the chapter. 1 Peter 1, I think verse 9, but, but both of them are having to do with living by faith, receive, receiving the end result of your faith. Like in 1 Peter 1, it says the end result, the consummation of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That's the total restoration, redemption, healed, delivered, made whole, kept safe and sound state of your soul through truth because you're living in truth. You have to understand this, that the way you grew up and the way I grew up, this isn't too hard to get. This is pretty simple. Watch. The emotional makeup that you've experienced in your life before Jesus has nothing to do with what God created. It's what you became through Adam. Living separate from God with no identity, being self-centered to the core. God didn't make you with the ability to be so angry that you could hate someone. That came through the fall. Adam didn't just sin. He took on the nature of God's enemy. And we were all formed in iniquity in our mother's womb and born into Adam. That's why we need born again. Anger came natural. Insecurity came natural. Self-consciousness came natural. God didn't, people say, well, you say about not living by feelings. God gave us feelings, not the feelings you grew up with, friend. I'm full of feelings, full of feelings, but they're not degenerate to my walk and they're not costly to you. They're not, they're never at your expense. They never write you off. I'm super passionate about things inside. I'm super passionate in my communication. But it's not the way it was before. It's all realigned. So you got to just break ties with that thing and say, wait a minute. The emotions I grew up with are so perverse. It's the wrong school. I was in the wrong school. I got to get out of this school. I've been homeschooled, but now I'm in the world and not of the world. So I have to change classes. I'm still in the world, but I'm not of it. I, I, I'm, in a different, I'm in a different school. I'm not conformed to the world. I'm transformed. That's not a 360. That's a 180. I'm transformed. How are you transformed? By working hard, biting your lip and praying a lot? You're transformed by your mind thinking like you've never thought before. By the renewing of your mind. Come on, this stuff is so important in a school like this, guys. I, I want you to love everybody you see. I want you to words of knowledge, man. And, and they'll happen because you're, you're under an anointing. There's an importation. Just the fact that you're here and God meeting your hunger. Who knows you're going to see things, perceive things and miracles and stuff. But man, you want to run well to the end and walk in a manner worthy of him. You want to leave a testimony in the hearts of men that you have been sanctified by the Lord. Hallelujah. And have no time for anything else. That man over there, he would sit, the guy with the big long dreads, he would sit in my truck and he would cry and say, I don't want anything but Jesus. I don't want anything. If you ever see anything in my life that doesn't look like him, dude, just kill me, man. Just kill me. And I'd say, I will. And we just keep driving. I'd say, I will. Don't worry. I will. And we'll believe you raise and come up right. But it was kind of our little joke, but it wasn't a joke when I'd say I will. And he'd say, just kill me. I watched him cry over and over. Didn't want nothing to do with sin. Didn't want nothing to do with unforgiveness. Didn't want nothing to do with judgment. Saw it as, as, as this outside a plague. Nothing to do with the life that's in me. Man. And it used to bless my heart. Because I didn't have a lot of people in my life that I could relate to that way. And he perceived that in me. And that thing probably, he sees it in the word. It just, 
I was his heartbeat, and I, I liked it. I never talked much to him about it. But I'm honoring it right now. I'm saying, man, I, I watched him cry a lot about living in purity. And the only time I'd ever call him, I'd say, you, you would get real intense. But he said, I just got to, I just got to say, just chill. You're on your way more than you realize. So, because some of us, we're, we're so hungry, we feel like we're not where we should be. So we're always aware of where we're not. And then we never enjoy where we are. And I was just trying to protect him from that a little bit without even him probably knowing it. Are you following me? This pure place is very important, or the scriptures I'm about to read right now wouldn't be here. I'm going to read now. I'm finally going to read. <laughs> I shouldn't have to preach much after I read. I'm looking at the subtitles in my Bible, like Ephesians 4, verse 17, it says the new man. That would be really cool to read, right? You read straight through, you, you get to Ephesians 5, and my subtitle was Walk in Love. Wow. Next subtitle, verse 8, Walk in Light. Next subtitle, verse 15, Walk in Wisdom. That sounds like we probably ought to just read this. It sounds like a Christian. So we're going to... Who knows, yesterday we talked about the gifts in the body of Christ as far as the fivefold, we call it the fivefold ministry. Some argue and say it's the fourfold ministry that pastors and teachers are one and the same. I, I don't have to decide that. I think we argue over little tidbit stuff. I think we better catch the point of why these people are in the body of Christ. They're in the body of Christ for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Watch. Till we all come, not most of us, he wants all of us to come to the unity of the faith. The faith. He stuck the word the in there so you realize it's the born again Christian perspective of why you're saved. And the knowledge of the Son of God. Now watch this. To a perfect or complete man. See, God is pulling off all limits here. He said, my grace is sufficient. I'm coming in grace. To a complete man, watch this, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is not humility to talk ourselves down. It's deception and it's pride. He's calling you here. We say, well, that's just us, you know. Well, it's a wonder God considers us. Well, you know how that old wicked flesh is. You know how that... Well, don't live in your flesh. Crucify it. Get in the water. Get him to hold you under longer. Whatever works, but... <sighs> Crucify. See, people say stuff like this. They don't realize what they're doing, and they give themselves away. They say, yeah, but brother, what you're talking about just freaks me out because everybody has their moments, man. No, stop. That's why you have yours, and you're afraid to believe something different because your experience is dictating your belief. Well, everybody has their moments, dude. You can't share a testimony like that. We're not perfect. Stop thinking that's a humble statement. Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. It means complete. When your belief's complete, there's a grace that comes to make your life more complete than you ever thought was possible. Why not go for that and see what it looks like? Instead of getting busy arguing over whether we have to sin every day or how long it has to be in between or maybe we're sinning and don't even know it or sinning while we're breathing. Instead of just wasting all kinds of time talking about that, why not just go after righteousness and let's see what grace produces and step into something that's always been there. <laughs> that feels good. Wonder if we do that. I bet that's called believers. Because the truth is you're believing something. You're even believing your past practice. You're either believing the language that we talk in the lunchrooms or you're believing the word. And without realizing it, without realizing it, I believe we have made our own human experiences Lord and we are following ourselves as we're saying we're following him. 
And we actually, some of us get tricked into believing we can only go so far and be so much. But that doesn't sound like what he's saying. L listen, let's read it slow. To a complete or perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Oh, that sounds so limited. That was facetious. That we should no longer be children just tossed to and fro and carried about by everything everybody's saying. But trust God's grace and believe his grace is greater. That he can actually empower me to live something that I never thought was possible. Why? So he gets all the glory. So I can really say without being religious, I am what I am by the grace of God. But it takes you believing. It takes you yielding and surrendering. Praying these things out when nobody's looking. You might have your mother-in-law down there listening, but you don't know it. Just be with him. Yeah. Ain't it something how productive God is? He's so redemptive. I'm up there having a beautiful time with the Lord. It's just me and him. And he's whacking my mother-in-law and I don't even know it. I ain't trying to minister. I'm just being in him. Yay. No longer children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind and doctrine and the trickery of men and cunning craftiness and deceitfulness and plotting. Come on, there's so many strategies out there designed to keep the kingdom of God from being revealed. But speaking the truth in love, watch this, we may grow up in how many things? All things, All things into who? Into him. He's the one we're following. Who is the head and he is Christ. I tell the sadly funny story of my kids when they were mid-teens. They sat me down and initiated a child parent talk. And they were, they were trying to justify their own desires and the decisions they wanted to make in their life. And I was the last hurdle they needed to jump. So he sat me down and tried to tell me how I'm too extreme and it's too much Jesus. And here's the thing. I never preached to my kids. I just lived my life and they were convicted by it. And they knew that God was in me and they knew the God of their daddy. And my kids weren't mad saying I'm a hypocrite or I'm up preaching, saying one thing and at home doing another. That's not the case. They just had contrary desires that they weren't quenching through relationship. So they were seeing me as a stumbling block in their life instead of a blessing because they had to somehow get around me. They were feeling like because of who I was, they were compelled and expected to follow everything. And even though they honored the God in me, they didn't develop a relationship. So they're honoring the God in me didn't empower them to live any of that. They felt pressured. My boy said, I have to do Jesus because he's my dad. That's what he told me he used to think as a teenager. That everybody's expecting him to be like me and do more than me. Everybody would come and give him all these prophecies, which really weren't prophecies. They, they, I, I, they weren't. It's just kind-hearted, kind-intending people. But it was causing more damage than good. They would come and say, you're going to not walk in the steps of your father. You're going to walk way beyond the steps of your father. And you're going to accomplish and da, 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 da. And they were always making his life a direct result of mine. Who knows his life should be a direct result of his relationship with Jesus. See, I sat my kids down a long time back and said, hey. I don't believe we live in a glass house. I believe we're Christians and uh, we live in a glass world. Our lives matter. And I'm not threatened by your choices, your conduct, because in the end, you will not be a reflection of me and how I parented. In the end, you'll be a reflection of you and how you handled your life in God. And I said, if I want, if somebody wants to see me, they might look at you to try to find me. They will find they were deceived. If they want to see who I am, they need to look to me. If they want to see who you are, they need to look to you. So please don't be under pressure. I am not going to push you guys to live any certain thing for my sake. You are not a threat to the Christ in my life. 
And I just told my kids that. And I told them a thousand times over to stop believing the lies and the pressure that they were letting come on their soul. And isn't it amazing how even though you tell them a thousand times, they'll still hold on to the pressure. Now that it's all over and they look back and they're like, duh. Yeah. And my son values me and respects me. They had this little parent, child parent conference, not parent child, child parent. They mentioned a couple leaders in our church. They mentioned a pastor and they said, well, even he and even he, they were looking around trying to find things that they could find and then comparing me to them and them to me. And they were like, but dad, like nobody's like living like what you're living. Like you're too, you're just over the line, dad. You're over the line. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm over the line. But you're just too much Jesus. Like everything's Jesus. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I said, let me try to tell you, help you guys with what you're doing right now. You have contrary desires in your heart. You're about ready to go eat the stew. You know, you're going to sell your birthright to eat the bowl of stew. And you're just trying to get around me. You see me as the last hurdle. You're trying to clear your own violated consciences. So you're coming up with a way to do what you're setting out to do. And use this as justification. I said, here's the problem. Those men you mentioned, man, don't, don't do that to those men. Don't bring them up in this conversation. Don't focus on their lives that way. For one thing, it's not fair to them. And for one, another thing, I'm not following them. So to compare my life to them and them to me is, is zero. I'm following Jesus. Yes. And I said, if you guys would just go take a good look at Jesus. Maybe you'll see that there is somebody that I'm looking like and that's looking like me because that's my goal. And it is all about him, kids. And they kind of like headed on out the room. <laughs> Isn't that something? Your conduct's important. Do you know how nasty it would have made that scene that I walked through with my family if my life was being lived in compromise? You might be amazed what the end result of that might have looked like if I was living my life in compromise and giving them a valid justification. So rather than feeling sorry for yourself because your whole family's doing that to you, maybe you ought to see you have a way higher calling. Send them the message of truth in the midst of darkness and let light shine. And trust in one day the, the whale's going to cough up folks. And they're going to land on the shore. Yeah? Guess what we're going to read? More of Ephesians 4. Okay, we're going to speak the truth in love and grow up into him in how many things? Verse 15, all things. And he is the head, right? He's Christ. From whom the whole body joined, knit together by what every joint supplies. This is just beautiful language. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. Man, if I'm reading this right, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but if I'm reading this right, the edification we receive isn't always the touch of the Lord and the drink of the Lord. It's the, it's the increased grace as we live in faith. This is an edifying of ourself in him. It's ultimately all grace, but we progress that action by stepping out in what's true. You see what I'm saying? So by you guys coming here, starting to walk in a lifestyle of true Christianity, look at the ultimate corporate influence that has in the big picture. Pretty hard to weigh. Pretty hard to measure. Wow. You get it? Okay. So this I say, verse 17, there's a section subtitled the new man. Watch this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Now you can read this and read it legalistic. That's what men have done. And then they teach law. And you could read this as a command, a rule, a law, 
Or you can be in your bedroom, sitting on your bed, and you can read this, and you could go, wow, Father, I thank you. I have a new life in front of me. Father, I used to be bound and constrained by all I knew, but now I know more. Man, I used to walk in the futility of my mind, but you've opened my understanding, and now I understand what my life is all about. Now I get it why I'm here. I used to think I didn't matter. I used to think I was a mistake, and now I know you had your eyes fixed on me the whole time, even before time. And man, I thank you for delivering me, saving me, and putting your life inside of me. And then you start reading more verses. And now you're not just reading your Bible. You're communing with the Lord, and you're praying and communing it back to the Lord and as you're reading it it's coming alive on the inside of you he says you're going to meditate day and night meditate that man that meditates he doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful he meditates day and night on the word of the Lord that man will be like a tree he'll be planted by the river of living water man his, his leaf ain't going to wither he's going to have fruit in season why? Because he's meditating day and night. Meditating. It means to muse and outwardly utter. Yeah. This I say, and therefore testify, Lord, you should no longer walk as a... Father, I thank you I'm born again. I thank you I'm in the world and not of the world. And that's not a self-righteous decree or an arrogant plea. God, you have delivered me from the lies that have ensnared me. You have put life in me and truth in me. God, you've opened the eyes of understanding. I am no longer living in darkness. I know why I'm alive. Man, if you would pray like that and not worry about who said what and who didn't what and why you didn't catch a break here. Ah, you pray like that and you won't even see that. <laughs> Having their understanding darkened. He's talking about the Gentiles being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them. Father, I thank you. I'm not ignorant anymore. God, I thank you. You've hold, held my heart accountable. You have put truth inside of me. When I'm reading my Bible, I'll just stop and talk like that right in the middle of reading. I'll just acknowledge truth in my heart. I'll say, God, and I thank you. That light, that light that's in me is going to shine and expose darkness. These people you're referring to, because of the light that you're burning in me, somebody's going to see this list is getting smaller. Somebody is not going to be alienated because you've entered me in. You just make decrees like that while you're sitting on your bed reading. You get it? Because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling and having given themselves over to lewdness, just living for things that don't matter except for the flesh. To work all uncleanness and greediness. You know, we see these, listen, we think he's always talking about like just some extreme sexual sin or violating a child or murdering someone. Listen, he calls unbelief an evil and wicked heart. Why? Because it resists everything that's true. It resists the kingdom. It resists everything that he paid for. Unbelief is an anti-finished work of Christ action. He calls it evil and unbelieving heart is evil and wicked. Ain't that something? He says, let no one be found with an evil and wicked or an evil unbelieving heart. And there's another scripture that calls it evil and wicked. Ain't that something? Watch this. Lewdness to work all kind of uncleanness and greediness. Watch. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. What's he saying? You find the truth through him. Truth has a name. He's Jesus. He's the word made flesh. You look at Jesus and you find life. You see life in the father. He's your model. You're following him. The only way we follow one another is as we follow Christ. Paul said, only follow me as I'm following Christ. Paul wasn't a cult leader. He wasn't like getting a bandwagon. He wasn't ministry driven. Hey guys, get in the Paul bandwagon. No, no, no. When the people were tempted to get on the Apollos, the Peter and the Paul wagon, he corrected it and called it sectarianism and redirected him back to Christ and said, you're living carnal. Stop it. He said, I'm glad I didn't baptize a lot of you or you'd all make me, you know, you'd all be in the Paul group. He wasn't happy with them for doing that. Right? 
We're Jesus people. We respect Todd. We love Todd. But you're not Toddamite. <laughs> you're not Danamite. Christ in us. And as he's received grace and as he's received revelation, you follow him as you see he's following Christ. And that's what God wants to reproduce. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I got silly there. I'm trying to fight it off. I was just thinking about his dreads and everything. And then people are like. Because you want to grow dreads because Todd has dreads thinking they'll be anointed. <laughs> Dude, it's like Samson. It's like you got the Nazarite thing going. I'm like, we used to stay in hotels and we'd be ready to go to bed and he was growing his dreads. I'd say, buddy, I don't know if I need prayer or what, but I feel this Delilah thing. It's coming all over me, man. <laughs> Remember? He'd say, he'd say, don't you do it, buddy. Don't you do it. I'd say, well, you'll love me. We know the message. You're going to love me anyway. If you wake up and I got a scissors in hand and I'm. But I said, I, I feel it coming on me, man. It's Delilah. She is all over me right now. <laughs> Shoot. I was crazy, man. When he was first growing them things out, it looked like a thousand worms sticking out of his head. They were all little and then he had them all grouped up into bigger worms. Now they're snakes. But he'd sit in the middle of the night. He'd be talking in his sleep and he's in the window. And I'm in a hotel bed and I look and there's Todd in a window. The Medusa, Greek goddess. I'm like, thinking I'm cement. I'm like, oh, thank you for covenant call. I was hoping he didn't look at me. Oh. He's crazy. I mean, you wake up at three in the morning and he's standing over your bed preaching. Hey, buddy, you okay? <laughs> One night he went, he was standing on my bed. He kept me up late. He kept, he's like a kid in camp. He's like, hey, buddy. I'm like, shh, bedtime. He goes, oh, well, just one more question, buddy. But what about, and then, and then he went on for 15 minutes. He says, oh, he says, that's wrong. I know you're listening to me over there. You hear me. You can't tell me you just fell asleep that quick. He said, so you're going to teach on love tomorrow and you're doing this to a brother tonight. <laughs> and, he would, and he would just go on and on and I would just totally ignore him because it's just time to go to bed. It's like 1.30 in the morning and I teach the early session. He don't teach the early session. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. So I lay down and I just, I just fell asleep in the middle of his hey buddies. And he probably went on though and talked for about a half hour. Well, you know you're hearing me. You know you listen to me over there. I can't believe you're ignoring me like this. You're supposed to love me, brother. <laughs> He'll sit there and just get quiet. Really? Are you serious? Really? <laughs> About three in the morning, he's standing right over my bed. He's talking. He's ranting. He's, into, he's in a dream. He's sleepwalking. And I'm like, are you okay, buddy? Hey, are you okay? And he goes, oh, oh I'm so, oh, I, hey, oh. And he goes in the bathroom of the hotel. And I'm like, I'm like, Lord, is he okay? Like, he comes out, he's back in the thing. He's like, well, yeah, yeah. And he gets over in his bed and he's sitting and he's praying for somebody. And he lays down. I thought maybe he was somewhere. Maybe, I don't know. But. So then we woke up in the morning and I said, you were by my bed last night, like at three or something in the morning. That wasn't a dream. I don't, that was real, weren't you? And he said, dude, I am so sorry. He said, I was sleepwalking. I remember coming too, but I don't even, yeah. He said, but I was just thinking, you really do live this message, buddy. Cause you looked at me at three in the morning and said, hey buddy, you okay? <laughs> that sure beats, would you knock it off? I'm trying to sleep. Here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing. When that's not even on you and you're not trying to say the right thing and suppress that. That's like driving in a car and boom, fender bender. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Supposed to be an example. LCU student. Witness, witness, witness. Hey, everybody. That would probably be weird. 
and that would probably be a day late. You want to be a wise man. And when the storm comes, tries to shake and beat down and break down what God's building, the storm's not even after the person inside the house. The storm's not even trying to kill the occupant. The storm's trying to knock down what the occupant was being built in. The storm is after the kingdom. Not you personally. But if you're a wise man and you've heard and you've applied and become, the storm beats and the house doesn't budge. Oh. So now you're not living. Stop, look, listen. You've become. And it's a narrow road called one way, the way. Ain't that awesome? Wow, I still got time. Why don't we do this? We'll get into this new man and you won't be distracted. You can go to the potty or something or stretch or something. Why don't we take a little break? Let's take a little break. We'll come back.